Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hi, all. On the show today, producer Paul and I do a deep dive into that vastly ignored virtue of patience. Typically, we just don't do well with being patient. I'm reminded of that old prayer, Lord, give me patience. I need it now. An interesting discovery in my conversation with producer Paul was that perhaps the greatest obstacle to patience is our natural proclivity for selfishness. We fall into that ever so annoying trap of thinking that life is all about me. What I want or perhaps what I feel that I need almost always takes precedence over anything else. Fascinating. I hope you enjoy this thought-provoking discussion and perhaps even discover some tools for learning to be patient that you might employ in your own life. So, on with the show. Tell me, when was the last time you received an email that just set you off? (laughs) This morning. (laughs) This morning? Oh, yeah. How was that? Well... I got an email that I could suddenly get in and get my vaccine done if I could get there in 30 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, drop everything. I've waited for a month, day after day, and finally they're like, lucky news, it's today. But the bad news is you got to get here now or who knows when you get it again. So so did you drop everything and get there? Of course, absolutely. Rearranged everything, raced over there to get it. And I just thrilled, but it, yeah. So look, so so now when you look at it in hindsight, was that big, was it that big of a deal? Oh well, you would have thought at the time I got to dis- disrupted my whole life here. Oh yeah, your whole life for for an hour. <laughs> my whole life has you know, this. They can't do this to me. And and that's the subject I want to talk about today. You know, I want us I want us to discuss the subject of. Patience. I, I hope I, you're going to do this quickly, though, because I don't have the patience to talk about this for very long. You know, neither do I, and I think there's <laughs> anybody else. So we'll just we'll just do it quickly and say we were um, somewhat <laughs> patient in doing it. <laughs> right. But you know, I experienced the same thing last night with an email. It was not about COVID. It was just an experience that was troubling email that indicated things were not going my way. Yeah. And you know, really. Paul, it, it really is all about me, isn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, and and if you're talking about when if, when you say me, you mean me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's going, yeah, it is about me. No, uh, it, it, I, I'm talking about myself. And um, and then you know you know what my natural response was. I wanted to respond immediately to that email and give somebody. Come up and <laughs> give them hell or my point of view because because things are not going my way and if it really is all about me then my way is the important way no matter what I've put in now fortunately as I was typing that impulsive email I read it to my wife Pam uh, which is always a wise thing to do <laughs> and I I have learned if is I'm she available to... <laughs> can I do that with her occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Pam, uh, can you look at mine, too, here? And and she reminded me that she said, you know, honey, um, I don't believe I would send that. <laughs> <laughs> is that her quiet way of saying don't? I, 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 don't, I don't think that's going to do you any good. And as I thought about it, even more likely it would stir up flames of sort of irresponsible anger and frustration on everyone's part. And then we just get into this deep, regressive spiral where it gets worse and worse and worse. And that is one of the reasons I hate email. You and me both. Is that... I'll just... give you another example. I'll give you... This is slightly different, maybe not as life and death as my earlier example. Obviously, we have a lot of shows here. And I was trying to set up a meeting. We have a new show starting. I was trying to set up a meeting with them. And we've been going back and forth in email. How about Tuesday at 2? How about Thursday at 3? How about Friday at 1? And finally, I just called him up and I said, can we just talk about this? Can we quit chating emails and just talk for 30 seconds like human beings? And they were so like, yeah, I guess. 
I mean, what an unusual experience. Yeah, what an unusual experience to just sit down for a few seconds and hash this out. And then we can go, rather than going to the effort, I, I throw one out, and 12 hours later, you give me a response, and three hours later, I give you a response. And we're ping ponging back and forth for the whole week, and your blood pressure's going up, and my blood pressure's going up, and the show's getting closer to starting, and we're no closer to having this meeting. Oh. Oh, and it and it, it's 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 worse, and the and and the emails get longer, oh. and they get impossible to read because right. of the length. And then we're getting testy with each other over what what are we getting testy about here? What am I getting ticked off about here? Yeah, and I I have I've sort of started a new plan with um, with the charity that I work with, and I've become increasingly involved. There's a lot of emailers, mm-hmm. and if it's information. I need to know, then I want an email. That's fine. Right. But if there's anything, what's your opinion on this or discussion, I just turn around and rather give my opinion, I make a phone call and say, we can discuss this in seven or eight minutes right. over what would take an hour of trading back and forth, typing and emails, miscommunication, misunderstanding. There's no tone of voice. They can't read the nonverbals. They can't, and you can't clarify immediately. Exactly. Because you got so many issues that you that you come up with, and I I think it it all has to do, maybe not all of it, but it is largely has to do with patience. How patient are we to consider an opposing view? How patient are we to consider if we feel that we are wronged by somebody to sit and consider that and. I am looking at now that patience is one of the most sublime yet most difficult of all virtues. What's the prayer of St. Francis? My mother always taught to me, God, give me the serenity to accept the things I can, or to uh, change the things I can and the serenity to accept the things I can't, something like that. Well, it is something like that. God, give me serenity to accept the things I cannot change, to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the know difference. Know the difference. There you go. Oh, my goodness. She drilled that into me, and I still can't remember it well, correctly. They, I never had the patience to listen to All you have to, to do is to go it. to AA meetings for a decade, <laughs> and it's set, it's at drilled into of, set at the beginning of every But it, it is meeting. that to, to just accept, oh, accept an answer, to not want everything quick, fast. It's, it's, like, it's like the prayer I used to hear is, uh, Lord, give me patience. I want it now. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That says it all. That says it all. That that um, and and yet you know it's not you know we were talking about email, but but it's patience over circumstances and events in life that we view as distractions or diversions from where we're trying to go. I don't have time to go there. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do that because my goal, my plan, is to accomplish whatever I have set, and this does not take me there. Now, I have to do an aside and say, I just wrote a blog on direction versus destination Mm. and saying if we're direction-oriented, it gives us freedom to move about, to to move in a certain direction, but it's like I was told one time heading west. This company said, we know we're headed west, but we don't know if our destination is, they were in New York, if our destination is St. Louis, L.A., or Seattle. So they don't know the destination. When you set a destination, you want nothing to get in the way. Yeah. and You would not have liked my driving as I'm trying to race to my COVID appointment. Already <laughs> upset that I've had to upend my day. How dare they? But thank you. I've been waiting for a month to get in there. And somebody dared to pull in front of me and go a little slow. Somebody dared to look like they didn't know where they were going when I pulled up to the center. And I was just so furious. Would you just get out of my way? I, you know, I am on What a, brings that about, Paul? What do you think that is? What, 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 do you, what do you think the core driver of that is? You're leaning back in your chair pondering. Yeah, I don't. I'm not quiet very often. You caught me on that one here. I'm not. No. I seem to experience that more as I get older. I'm less patient. I'm less willing to wait. You think I'd be more willing to wait because I've learned you can't rush everything. But when I want to go somewhere, be somewhere, do some, particularly if it's there's a certain period of time, I got to get there. Get out of my way. 
everybody. And everything that stops me, slows me down, raises my anger. You, you know, I think that is, seems to me, that has a lot to do with that, again, that destination mentality that I mm-hmm. have an objective, a place to be, a thing to do, and it has to be done by, in this certain period of time, or by some deadline that's either false or sometimes a real deadline, but even real deadlines have flexibility in right. them. And and if anybody gets in the way of that, they're getting in the way of my plan, what's important to me. What's important to me. Somehow they're they're and, they're they're attacking me, they're blocking me. And I think it's I do say it's something bigger than that. I do say in its accumulation effect. We're so, so many things we're not in control of. Oh my goodness, social media, our lives, our calendars. Wait, 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 let's back up. Let me just ask you this. What are we in control of? (laughs) Seriously. I want to be in control of everything. I want to be. I hope I am. I'm in control of my life, I think. Yeah, that's why you're a hoarder. (laughs) That's why I'm a hoarder, yeah. (laughs) I want to be in control. I aspire to be in control. And the minute I'm reminded I'm not in control... I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm uh, attacking. I'll give you a perfect example. You know I don't like to fly. When I do fly, when I'm forced to fly, I have to really psych myself into it and say, this is going to be, I picture all this is going to be slow, the plane's going to be not going to be on time, you're going to miss your connection, the bag's not going to arrive. I mean, all these things I start thinking, I start to accept, yes, this experience is going to have all of those. Accept it. Get over it. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be pleasant. Only when I accept those things, do I. Then am I surprised? Oh, the bag made it. Oh, that was that wasn't so bad. Oh, the plane didn't crash. Oh, okay. It's sort of like Scott Peck's great quote from *The Road Less Traveled*. The opening sentence is that uh, first thing we have to admit is life is difficult, and once we admit that life is difficult, it is no longer quite so difficult. Yeah. That's beautiful. And that's, and that's what you were saying, that, that's that this flight could, all the, these negative things are going to happen, and then when they don't, then you're pleasantly surprised. I am, yeah. But, but I think, I think on, on the other hand, talking about what you, when you were talking about, about things getting in the way, mm-hmm. there is a certain freedom when you don't have your objectives and your way in mind. There is a freedom that is a beautiful freedom to accept what we would call interruptions, distractions, Mm. diversions. They are not interruptions. In the economy that I deal with, in in the divine economy, those are all part of the process. All these, this is not a diversion. This is not a distraction. This is not an interruption. This is your real life. Yes. We use Terry is, talk about it all the time. He has that exercise he quotes all the time where he sort of sends somebody out. I forgot how it goes, but he sort of sends somebody out into the woods for a while and they come back and what did you see? And they're like, nothing. You know, it was, I was looking for something. No, you weren't looking at things. I didn't send you to go look for something. I didn't get, send you out to go get a pail of water. I just sent you out. You know, do you, I don't know if you recalled, he said in our last podcast that when he would visit Joshua Tree, they would give him. Yeah. A, oh, yeah. A, a guide, but it's not not a personal guide that guides you. It's a guide book. Right. And the adults had all these places that they had to go. Check, children, check, check. Right. Children go to a place, sit down, ponder. What do you see that's beautiful? Yeah. What moves your heart? You know, trans. As opposed you. to don't be. You got to be. You got to see this a uh, vista, and you got to make uh, this tree, and you got to see this rock, and you got to. Here's all our landmarks. You got to make sure you. You talk about this when you go to Europe and other places. You know, you get on that mentality. Okay, it's the tour bus. Now we got to see four more cathedrals and three more of this and four more of this. And, and that's and that's all gone. At you know, I I I experienced that, and now that I've seen them, a, a cathedral is a cathedral, <laughs> and and. And if I see it, that's nice, but but I am now going to experience cultures, mm-hmm. experience something different. And so I'm ready for surprise for something new. But but let, let me talk let me talk about an experience that I'm having right now in that um in the charity that I'm working with, as mm-hmm. well as of life. Right. Um our CEO has to take a uh is taking a little bit of a hiatus. He's still really involved, 
but other members of the of the charity are taking charge and take, taking he's got to step out for a while and you guys got to step up we he he has to step out for a while he'll be involved but he has to step up for a while and the rest of us have to step up which means for me as a volunteer as I'm now looking at the workload it's becoming a full-time job and so my first inclination was this is taking me away from the path that I wanted to go on, that I, mm-hmm. I have sort of a path of, of a teaching, coaching, mentoring sort of path. So you admit it, even you who are wandering and trying to ponder the roses along the way and be open to surprise, you still have a destination. No, You're, it's a it's a direction. A direction, okay. It is a direction. These are I, I have no idea what the coaching would look like, what the mentoring would look like, what the audience would look like. I just know there's something, there's a message that's being given to me in process. But anything that suddenly, you came up with this, you either felt it was an inspiration or or an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Now something has presented it that's a diversion, that's a distraction. That seems like a diversion. However, as I'm already in the process, it is not a diversion. It is a keen sense of teaching that whatever I want to coach, whatever I want to do, has to be has to be involved in everyday life in the ordinary life in this world and i have to integrate because a lot of my work is going to be spiritual work mm-hmm. this is the integration of the spiritual and the real life if i only live in the mystery and the spiritual life i'm no earthly good there's nothing that i can do to help people but once i experience i can translate this mystery into everyday life. Mm -hmm. This is a learning experience. And so I feel that the call, that this is not a distraction, this is actually a learning experience. This is teaching me to do what I want to do better, that when I teach it, I will have experience of having lived with it. Mm -hmm. I will live with these times of impatience and these times of, wanting my way this thing with my charity is not a detour it's it is a god sent it is a god sent exercise so can i give you another way to look at it please I, this is always uh, supposedly john lennon's quote life is what happens while you're busy making other plans precisely this is life happening. You have made other plans. You've, uh, I'm headed in this direction, and now you're being diverted, pulled, blocked, stopped, whatever. And all of that we find frustrating. We don't have the patience to understand or accept that. And, and that is really what is required is patience. Right. But once I found that I understand that it is not a detour, that it is part of the process, it's life. I no longer need patience. That is that is the cure for my patients because I'm heading in the direction that I wanted to head. This is just part of my path. This, I'll give you another example in my life. We haven't talked about it much on this show, but my I only have one daughter, and I adopted her when she was 10. Uh, she's uh, brought up in, a, in Mexico in a foreign village. She was brought into the country illegally, beat up, fell into foster care, and we set out to adopt a child from foster care. And so when we started the journey and made the decision, I said, this is going to be easy. Yeah, I got some money. I don't have a criminal record. Stable relationship. Stable job. You know, I must be ideal. We'll we'll have a kid by Tuesday. (laughs) (laughs) And month after month after month, bordering on a year we got nothing like what's wrong with me we so i got to take control my the agency we're working, working through catholic social services we're good catholics every month no nope, nothing for you this month we're, we're, we're working on it i don't like this i got to take control of the process what can we do there are kid fairs you can go to you can where they have kids running around the park and you sort of pick one out sort of like a, going to a, pick out a puppy at the you know are uh, you serious? oh yeah it was horrible Oh, um, books goodness. you can look through. I'm trying to. I'm trying to take control of this process. This isn't going like I thought it would. Come on, let's go. 
it was only when I surrendered and let go, let God, all that kind of stuff I'd been taught, but I guess didn't really believe. And I just sat back and I said, my wife kept saying, it'll happen when it's ready. I don't want to hear that one. That does not make me happy. I wanted she to. She sounds ha- like a good counterpart. Oh, for you. she is. And when, and she re- and I finally had to accept, like, maybe it's not going to happen. And okay, I'm just going to stop thinking about it and trust we've got good people working on this. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And it'll happen in God's time, not my time. And when the right opportunity presents itself, well, it took us almost a year to find somebody. And most of it, we were doing nothing except me running around acting like I was in charge of this thing. I wasn't in charge of any of it. That's not unlike when my wife and I decided we wanted to have a child and we were not that young. I believe I was 39, and so that would make my wife a few, just a few years younger than me. But, you know, the female body at 35, at th- the female body at 16 is a baby-making machine. Yeah, right. You it, breathe. It, it's, it's, a, it's a baby-making machine. <laughs> right. But a female body at 35 is not a baby-making machine, so we had to go to a fertility doctor. Right. Well, you know, I patiently went with that, and we we had miscarriages. We had oh, different yeah. issues that, that went with it. And at one point, I finally said, enough. We're done. And so my wife agreed. We told the doctor we're done. And after we told the doctor we're done, the next month we got pregnant. See, I've heard that story so many times. Have you, it's just was, it's, it was just crazy. When you quit trying, it happens. And, and again, in my economy, that is a divine intervention. And that also has to do, but it also has to do with, with my psychology and how my psychology is, is, and with my wife is impacting our physiology. Uh, but you, you got, you're a good American male. We're not brought up to just sit back and see what happens. We're taught to take charge. And it has been damaging, Paul. Yeah. It has been, it has been ter- terribly damaging. I think I, I love much of the way we are raised. I love, I love being goal-oriented. I love having some objectives in life, but they must be soft goals because our goals are always moving targets, rarely you never set out to be an engineer. You set out to be a publicity agent. You set up to be a publicist. Something, yeah. That that was there was something different than this. I was going to be a rock singer. Okay, and <laughs> and and I, you know, I I was going to be I, I was going to be an executive, and then I was going to be a minister. Who knew I would be coaching executives? That I would be managing baseball teams. And that I would be the vice president of a charity. But you know, there are some who do it. Your son, when he came in and told his story a couple of times, I mean, he was pretty intentional. You said 10, 11. He said, Mommy and Daddy, I'm going to be a professional baseball player. I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah, right. This week you're going to be a professional baseball player. No, I'm going to be a professional baseball player. And to achieve what he did, become a professional baseball player, to a certain degree, he had to have that kind of drive, that kind of single-mindedness, that kind of focus uh, to get there. Had he you wandered, he of, might not have made it. I agree. But do you know what kind of patience he's had to have during the process? Oh. Broken relationships. I mean, he, he was with Maggie all the time, but that was not smooth running some of the time because of his ego on the road. And focus, um, I, I got it. This is about me. Well, I want to go. I know, but I got to do this. It's the, the goal is comes first. Yeah. And and now Maggie has to be equal in that. So they've got it during the season. The goal has to be baseball, but off season, the goal is Maggie. Yeah, right. The, the goal is taking care of his wife. And he said it took him a while to get and, to that point. And yeah. he's, and he's had, as you know, we, as we have said, he's had tremendous successes and tremendous. We can call him. He says, I'm a failure. You know, at, at hitting, I'm a failure, and I need to, and I'm working on that. But that's not part of his goal. That's a that's an obstacle, a detour that could cause some people to quit the sport. But he is. He got traded. Oh my goodness! You you're all so horrified. Uh, baseball players are supposed to be traded a dozen times in a life, but he got traded once, and and everybody's like, oh. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was that was um, an interesting time. But we're really we're we're very glad for the trade right now. Very glad because because under your analogy, 
every trade, every move, every divergence opens up a new possibility. It's He's new learning point. more about a whole wording, working with Tito Francona and the and the Indians and mm-hmm. Tito Francona, one of the best managers in baseball. Mm-hmm. He's got a whole new experience. He has mm-hmm. a whole new vibe. See, right. He has everything that he would not have gotten had that he, he stayed, stayed at the organization that he was at. Um, so why again do we see change and obstacles and everything as bad? And we see focus and determination and single-mindedness and taking charge as good. Because that's what that's what our parents taught us. That's what schools, we were educated that way. We were improperly educated. We were not educated to be problem solvers. We were not educated to be... Adaptive. Ad- adaptive, flexible, you know. uh, somewhat risk-taking, oh, no. knowing that knowing that take risks are going to take you on these diversions Mm -hmm. and sidetracks. Which can be dead ends, which can be, you know, learning. But they're they're not, see, here's here's going to be my argument on that. They're they're not dead ends. They're dead ends goal-centered, but character-oriented. They are not dead ends. They are character builders. The things that we do not achieve our accomplishments are if we're, totally aware and that we patiently reflect on that that those turn out to be wonderful learning experiences you know how many times have you read that we learn from our failures and our mistakes more not from our not from our successes yeah because our successes we don't grow from our successes no. we've arrived there I hear that all the time in here we do a lot of business shows and they're always talking about you know Hurry up and fail. You're going to learn more from the failure than you are. And yet we're not taught to embrace failure. We're not taught to seek failure. We're not taught to talk about failure. You know, we're taught to just focus on winning all the time. Success, straight line. It's a life is a straight path, I was taught. Uh, and, you know, you, you come up with, an, you go to school, you come up with something you like and you're good at and you find a career, and you build it for the next 30 or 40 years. I know you were raised on that. Tell me. How much much of that has come true? Zero. And how much of that has come true with people that you know? Zero. It just does does not. You know, use the example of my son. He's probably closest to that. He's closest to it, yeah, right. But his interior life is totally different than what he was a Mm -hmm. decade ago. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's night and day what he has learned interior-wise. So that's why I'm thinking if we just take a moment to sit back and think about what is going on, let's just take, let's take the, the right-in-the-moment email and let's take the long-term career diversion. Right. The, the the short term email the annoyance is is a microcosm of the macrocosm right it's that i want things my way my way is the right way i've worked my tail off to get this done how dare you come and interrupt what i'm doing because and i've I worked know too I'm hard right. for it i want it now i I've, I've worked to, i want it now I, I i just want it to begin with but right. i do i do want it now and and i'm going to uh discuss as we close out the podcast, I'm going to discuss some antidotes to this that may be helpful. Well, let's say you want to take a break and everybody yeah, digest this for a second. Yeah, let's take, let's take a second. big break. A big break, a little break. Okay, well, hang on because I didn't. I, you got me talking so much I didn't have the break music up here. So give us a vamp. Remind us again what the topic for today is, and then we'll vamp into a little music. The topic is waiting for patience. And it's also that we haven't even talked about. It's the embracing of the ordinary. Okay, all that and more right coming after this. Hi, this is Charlie Hedges, and you're listening to The Next Chapter with Charlie. Today, producer Paul and I are talking about Patience, but in a very broad sense of patience, and we're talking it in a in a microcosm. Like, can you be patient when receiving an an offensive email, and then can you be patient when your life seems to be 
distracted by journeys and destinations that don't seem in sync with where you want to go in life. And yet those are also times to to express patience. And so I you know, I wanna I wanna carry on a little bit more about about patience that I have learned in the last year. Now in the in Wait, the I last gotta take a breath and see if I'm patient enough to listen to these here. Well okay. okay. I'll, I'll I'll cut you off, don't worry. It, 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 in all seriousness, don't we want to reduce everything down to all right, I'm glad we listened to this. Now, give me the two or three takeaways. Get to the point. Get me the. We all want to r- r- drive to that point. Yeah, I want. I want to just do one more setup to get to that point because right. we are going to get to that point. You know, I've alluded to this several times, but I want to do it directly. I, as the listeners and you know, have been pursuing the mystery of God more than the knowledge. And although I'm, I'm, I'm reading very, very deeply into the knowledge. Which oh, doesn't strike me as something with quick answers. It seems like a process that you have to be patient with as you dive into mysteries, by definition, don't have answers. By definition. And that, I believe, life is a mystery. Yeah. Life does not have answers. And I see the orchestration of, call it God, call it universe, call it source, Call it whatever whatever you want to call it. There is some orchestrating, let's say, entity that that is divinely giving me opportunities. And as long as I know, like this detour that I'm working with a charity is not a distraction, it is a divinely orchestrated plan to get me to the destination that has been set for me in collaboration with the divine. That's a lot. You are accepting that all these things aren't obstacles that are keeping you from something, but something that may be showing you something you need to know at this moment. Oh, Paul. Last night in my thoughts before, you know, I have a candlelit room and I I go to my thoughts before I go to bed. And We're turning into a good Catholic here. Yeah, I know. (laughs) I know with my crucifix and and my icon of Jesus. (laughs) Your candles. I'm a pretty good candle, yeah. And I've got my my communion set up, so I'm not a good candle, a good good Anglican there. I mean, a good Catholic there. I'm a good Anglican Anglican, there because I can... I can give myself communion. <laughs> um, but but during that time, I had an opportunity to really consider what were the issues going on. And quite honestly, when I saw my responses to email, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed by myself to think, you know, it was just all about you, Charlie. It mm-hmm. was all about your pride. You didn't think about one single other person, what their opinions are, that they had really, really valid opinions, yet they were not, they did not agree with mine. And so I I got angry. And then in my time of meditating and considering this, I realized it was my selfishness, my pridefulness, my need to satisfy my own, own desires, not the desires above me, not the higher level desires that cause peace, unanimity, and cause and co- and, and and result also in progress in, in a movement forward. And it was it was deep learning. I was I was truly truly saddened in noticing that I'm thinking at my age and as long as I've been doing this. I should be past all that. Yeah, right. But I'm not. That's what struck me. I, I find I'm getting less patient. You think I'd be more patient as you get older. I find myself being less patient. Why do you think that is? I, I maybe I don't want to get too deep, but maybe because time's we running out. Deep here. Time's running out. You know, so, life. So, what are you heading for that you're going to? That can't, you're going I can't to miss? suffer fools. I can't waste time. I can't uh, wander. I got to get. More laser focused, uh, you know. What if what if suffering fools is part of your journey? Oh, Charlie, 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 I don't tell me that. 
But it is. Yeah. Because uh, how are they fools? Well, in the COVID case, they're disorganized. They're chaotic. They're they're confusing. They're all the things I hate about life. And I they're just to... starting up. They're trying to figure out their system. Yeah, but I don't care. That's They had six months to figure it out. No, they didn't. They had about a month. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> when they come, I, I see. Find... See what what it comes to, Paul, is it comes to. I will say the words again. It comes to our selfishness, that we are what matters, and that my goals are more important than anybody else's goals or processes. And if you don't fit into my preconceived idea of what it's like. I'm going to be pissed off because you're not obeying my rules. Right. And they don't they don't know your rules and quite honestly, they don't uh quite excuse me, give a shit about your rules. <laughs> about my about you're talking about my rules? I'm talking about your rules. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. But this is cuz I got the now, I got the you, right rules, you know. Now if you go back on that and you ponder that, you meditate on that, you will see I guarantee you will see the selfishness yeah. and the egocentricness, and it will be embarrassing, and that can be a learning for you in the future. I, I was embarrassed how rude I was trying to race over to get to this thing. I almost cut some poor lady off. She doesn't know I'm in a rush. She doesn't know i got to get there in five minutes. She's just wandering along like she does every day. She's in no rush. I'm the one that's in a rush. And I'm mad at her because she's blocking me. And they're still going to accept you if you're five minutes late. Oh, yeah, exactly. So let me give you another thought that just popped into my brain. Does any of this have to do with trust? It has everything to do with trust. Trust God, trust the plan, trust that it means something. I don't trust a lot of things anymore here. You're um, anticipating where I'm going, and that's right where I wanted to go. This is everything about trust. Once again, we get biblical, but, but this is... Everything is about trust of God. Everything is about trusting of your higher power over yourself. And that that is setting the stage all for your love and for your growth. It is not setting the stage for some sort of divine mandate that you're going to accomplish, you know, saving the world. It is for what is about you what is about your relationship with yourself, your relationship with other people, and your relationship with whatever you may call the divine? Those are, those are the things that are being impacted by our selfishness. It's called, it's called the small self. It's that, that ego-centered, selfish, it's all about me self, as, a, as opposed to the unified self that is unified with the cosmos, unified with humanity, unified with other people. And in doing so, we have much more compassion, knowing that we're not just the only one. But if we do not have patience to sit back and think of that, consider that, and then move forward with that knowledge, we're just we're screwed, you know. We're we're going to live our life angry. People live our people live typically in the ones who live in anger. The root cause of anger, I believe, is fear. Yes, and, I, and, I agree. And it is fear, you know, of what? It is fear of not getting things my way, or not understanding the plan. Nobody tuned me in. Why is this happening to me, God? I can't help but think of your friend, John Bash, who came in as a guest and now does a show here on the station, Church Hurts And. And the and is all about what his show is. Okay, so we've all had bad experiences in his case with church. The church lets you down. The church abuses people. The church misuses people. The church leaders are humans and fail and fall and all these things, and maybe they weren't there for all these things. That's just and, a glorious overview. Yeah, but but the hope <laughs> the hope of it is and and what do you do? Quit, give up, stop. That's what a lot of people have done. I'm not going to go to church anymore. I don't believe in God. This is uh, life didn't work out the way it is. I'm mad at you, God. I'm mad at my church. I blame everybody. I don't understand it. I don't like it. I quit. And his example is the most stunning one of all. He's got a couple of them. His son's a quadriplegic. Right. His son's a quadriplegic. Right. Handsome. 
successful on the path. Your son dives into his pool of water, hits his neck, and suddenly comes out a quadriplegic. And they had some one of his friends on the other day, and he said, took me a long time to accept this, long time to have the patience to see where this is going. He said, I hate to say it, in some ways I'm a better person than I was before this happened. And it's like, really? I, I would say he's a better person. He's a different person. Would he, would he prefer another circumstance? Sure. Absolutely. But he is a better person as a result. Right. Because he is learning the ways of life. Right. And acceptance and trust and all these things that do not come easy. So some of us are really forced to face these issues. And I just wonder when we're really forced with the tragedy, with the big diversion, with the big failure, with the something that didn't work out, do we quit or do we trust and go on? That's kind of the genesis of his, his show. Well, How let's, uh, let's continue from there and let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Okay. And I have, instead of just our conversation, you know, I have five ideas okay. of how we deal with, and we can discuss each one, of how we deal with lessons learned from lack of patience and quick to anger right. or quick to be frustrated. Right. And, and the first one is right in line with what you have to say. As you might anticipate, um, the number one cure for me is trust in God or the universe. I've, as long as I trust in that, and that what is being being presented to me in my path, that I then must deal with, that I it is my responsibility to deal with. I'm certainly getting assistance and getting aid, but it is my responsibility to deal with. And let's use the charity once again. This is not a distraction. This is a wholly integrated venture in my life that is going to make me a better man, make me more qualified to do what I am beginning to see the callings. I, I don't know. I'm seeing my direction, but I, I'm just beginning to get clarity. And I can see how this is going to impact that so much. And even if it doesn't impact that, it's impacting me as an individual. Mm -hmm. It's letting me know of my selfishness. That it is, it is not about you, Charlie. There are others involved. And that I must be patient in this process, going through the process of divining, is this the will of the divine or is it Charlie's will? Someday you should do a show on sacrifice because it sort of reminds me of that. We're not brought up to think of sacrifice. We, we admire the person who throws themselves on the hand grenade that jumps and saves the baby on the track and does something. At some levels, we're, we admire those people. But I think few of us would want to yeah, sacrifice I think anything. That's an, I think that's an interesting question, Paul, but I don't think it really fits right here. I'm just sacrifice. saying that it, it's a part of that trusting. Yeah. It's a trust that you. this is where you're supposed to be. I didn't want to be here, but I guess I got to be here. I got to do this. You know, I, I have to do I have to do a bit of explanation on this that we are trusting we are trusting in the love of God, that God created all of creation was created so that God could bestow love upon his creation and receive love by his creation. And every time we do not allow ourselves to receive the love of God and give the love of God, it is that is where the offense is. That is the heart of the root word of the not root word, but of the word sin. It is not so much about action as much as it is rejection of God. And as long as I understand that is what's going on in this process, is God teaching me to depend on Him, trust on Him, and further embrace the love of God, the more beautiful life is, the more serene life is, the more confidence I have in life. That that it is it is specifically not just for my good being that I can accomplish what I want to accomplish. Right. It is about relationship. That is that is key. And so, so that is that's what trusting God is. Seeing it about. in some bigger picture, seeing it in a different light, believing there's some purpose to this. Oh, there is an absolute purpose, and the purpose is love. I mean, it just, it, there, 
there is no other purpose in life, but that's all. So whole, I'd love to hear your other, you had a couple, three or four other things. Yeah. There. So you get a bad situation or you get a bad email. I've already, I've already alluded to this. If you are going to respond to it and you find yourself responding negatively, understand that's only going to create a regressive spiral. It's only going to get worse. The, the other person is going to respond bad, badly. You're going to respond even worse. I don't know how many relationships have been broken up over email. Or social media. I think it's the sin of social media. It's, it, it's, it, it prompts you to do a quick emotional knee-jerk reaction. Well, screw you. And then they say, well, screw me. Screw you. You're, and, you're deleted from my Facebook account. Yeah, boom. And suddenly you're, we're you're at up. each other. And what are we even fighting about here? Yeah. So that's why I recommend, I recommend a 24-hour, like a day <laughs> before, you know, when it's really serious. And you can, you, when your ire is up and you can feel your buttons have been pushed, put it on a 24-hour hiatus. Good idea. A night over sleep. And I guarantee when I've done that, I, my response is entirely different the next day. I read it with different eyes. I read it calmer. I don't read it from my emotions. Life looks different in the morning. My, and, and I strongly encourage that when you are inclined to respond negatively and it doesn't call for an immediate response and you think an email recalls, no email recalls, calls for an immediate response <laughs> because a lot of people don't even look at their email daily. Yeah. But so again, that's the that. sin of texting and social media. It seems to suggest, it seems to demand in our mind an immediate response. Which is damaging, which is terribly damaging. And therein lies the next rule, which really, which which impacts this last rule of waiting. And then I read, oh, there was a wise book, a little wise book of sayings and stories that came out once a week. And one of the ones I read said words that have stuck with me for 40 years and said, when communicating with other people, if you have difficult or tough things or harsh things to communicate to another person, say them. Yes. Do them in words I, so you can dialogue. Boy, I believe that. There are and, just certain things you can't send somebody. I read about people who divorce somebody by fax that leave them in a voice message and say, we're done, you're fired, or we're through. I can't believe people yeah. do this. Certain things demand face-to-face. -face. And on the, other, on the other hand, the writer said, while you say the tough things verbally, write down the good things and publish how proud of them you are, Boy, that's interesting. How, how well you think they're doing, how you appreciate their friendship, that will go, you're building into the emotional bank account and you're making incredible deposits in the emotional bank and account. And how touched we are when people take the effort to write anymore, to really send you something. I have actually a file right here of little things people have written about this radio station or somebody's been on the station. And it isn't a big file. I'm not saying that people don't like it, but that's such a rarity that people write a letter to the station or write a letter to us and thank us for something. I'm so moved that I'm moved to save them. And instead, they want to write you how you can change oh, and what I, sucks. I get that all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's just, it's just And I haven't saved any of those. <laughs> so, so you say the difficult, you write the wonderful. That's beautiful. It really is. It, 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 it really is because we have such an emotion. We, we have such a thing called an emotional bank account. And we have deposits and withdrawals, and you need three to four deposits minimum for every withdrawal. It's more like five or six deposits for every withdrawal. So your bank account is full. When you make a withdrawal, you still have you have a bank account that is, that's in the that's in the black, not in the red. I just think in my own life, the few times people have written something flattering or it, it, it just stuck with me. I've saved them. They're mementos. Uh, when people have written nasty things to me, I throw them away. And I don't, I, they might stick with my brain and bother me, but I don't hold on to them in the same way that I hold on to a happy thought. A friend of mine sent me a workbook that she had written on um, following the path of life. 
And it's a workbook, so it didn't require, you know, reading a, 180 pages, but it took maybe 30 to 45 minutes to, to read it. I took notes, and then I write down. I wrote down what I liked about it. Mm -hmm. She was stunned. Yeah. said, I've never received anything like that. Anybody's actually read and edited and given me feedback on, on what worked in it. I mean, she just... She was incredibly moved because no one does that. Well, I will tell you, as you alluded to, I did public relations many years ago, and I did it start off in the entertainment, Hollywood, working with famous celebrities and TV shows and stuff. And I will tell you that the movie studios track fan mail, seriously, because they think that for every person that actually took the time to write a letter about how much they loved that show or that movie, they're speaking for a lot more. Speaking for a lot of people. Yeah. So let's go to the let's go to the meditative techniques that um, you know I meditate daily and and it is to take you don't have to take 10 20 minutes in meditation take 1 minute 2 minutes breathe deeply and try to get your mind set on an entirely different open subject and, and, you know, it's sort of an unknown subject. Try to release the emotions that you can. To the degree that you can do that, you are freeing yourself up to tap into the true, beautiful self rather than that small, egocentric, selfish self. But breathing, there, there is something amazing about breathing. We don't there breathe. Is, yeah, we don't breathe. We don't breathe. I'm taking a deep breath as you're talking about this here. It somehow makes you just... <sighs> Slow, yeah. slows you down. Makes in you... with your nose and out with your mouth. Yeah, that's the that's the the technique. Um, when I get panicky in an airplane, that's what they always tell me to do. Start controlling your breathing as you get into a panic attack. Yeah. yeah. And the last thing that I have, so you know, we talk about we talk about trust. Twenty four hours. Say tough things. Write pleasant things. Breathe deeply. And then another one is just to think. It's just to think, if I have a negative perspective about my so-called detour in life or a negative perspective about a particular email mm -hmm. that someone sent to me and I want to respond that I don't want interruptions or I don't want these emails, I wrote, quite frankly, if I have a negative response, I have to ask myself, what the hell am I about to do right now, and what might be the consequences? Yeah, right. Just ask, are there consequences to what I'm doing? And if you see nothing but negative concepts, or not negative consequences, it will impact your decision to move forward. And to say, I need to sit on weight on this. I need to be patient on this. So you're leading to a future show, which is about thoughtfulness. This is something you and Terry allude to all the time, purposefulness, uh, to have that we just live our lives in such a knee-jerk reaction. Yeah, and it's purposeful, purposefulness, not in, what do I want, not in what I want to accomplish in life, but who I want to be. Yeah, right. It is very different, not what I want to do or achieve. It is who I want to be internally. What kind of person do I admire? But what so kind many of, of us are counterpunchers, are, are reactive people. We are. We've been taught that. And so that's the purpose of this podcast and of talking about this is to encourage folks to think differently, think out of that productive box that we were taught, taught in schools, you get this grade, you study this, you answer this, you're on the road to success, which is just baloney. You're, you're, you're and not. And if somebody gets in your way, strike back. If somebody comes at you, fire back. You know, we, we're not taught to just sit back and take it. We're not taught to, we're taught to turn the other cheek, but few of us do. You know, we're taught. Well, we're to, not even taught that well, Paul. I think I think the church sometimes is guilty of not really. The church is can sometimes be very judgmental, oh, rather than absolutely rather than aligning with love, and aligning with the will of God, and aligning with God's desire to have intimacy with 
with his creation. Right. It's not aligning. It's all with about that. thou shalt not. The thou shalt not. And that's why that's why I like um and and we'll kind of wrap up the, the teaching on this. That's why I kind of like in the New Testament the Beatitudes as the New Testament version of the of the Ten Commandments. Mm, and think about that one. It's wonderful. Blessed are those who mourn, weep, hunger for thirst and righteousness, hunger for peace, for hunger for purity. Um, blessed are the peacemakers. Yes, and and it's it's not blessed are those who honor their father and mother and don't commit murder. Now, those are truth. I'm not denying the truths of those. <laughs> I'm saying the 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 fulfillment of those come into what Jesus had to say in the Beatitudes. It's not the but blessed are those who fight their way and accept no BS. <laughs> <laughs> blessed are those who get their way. <laughs> blessed are those who get their way, yeah. yeah. That's what we believe. We may not be taught that. Well, today has been an interesting talk on patience and a number of other things. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed our talk, Paul, as usual. Thank you for joining me in this process. Thanks for bringing these ideas up. Yeah, good. I appreciate that. I also want to thank our listeners for tuning in to The Next Chapter with Charlie. And, and I would ask you to please be sure to check out our website at thenextchapter.life. It's not .com or .net. It's .life, L-I-F-E. And on that site, you will find our weekly blogs and podcasts. And you can, if you wish, you can always subscribe and make it even easier to access, to access either one. So with that said, until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.